The rock and roll world is bringing me down. I'm gonna hit them back to my little town. Enough of it and going back to my little town. I've known pleasure and I've known pain. Well, with the blues, it's all the same. I had the choice and I've been made to choose. I had to fight and I had to lose. I slept in bars, cars, palaces, and big feather beds, ranches, branches, and southern homesteads, motels, hotels. But I've heard it said that home is where the heart is, and heading back to my little town. Okay, so we thought we need to start late, but yeah, thank you for coming. So yeah, I like to walk around. So it seems you all survived the party of last night. How was it? <laughs> so right. So yes. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about succeeding by failing, and I think you got annoyed already with all the flyers that I put around. Sorry for that. And you might be wondering, like. What, why, where does the iceberg come in, right? Because we have succeeding by failing the iceberg in these careers. Well, this is the iceberg. Obviously, you know what it is. But what does the iceberg tell us? So, yeah, we always see the peak, but uh, we don't quite see the bottom, right? And in a way, I see success and failure in a similar way. So you see just the success on top. But in reality, there is a lot of failure underneath, which we don't quite see or we don't quite openly talk about. Uh, okay, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, I can't pick on anyone, so I'll have to pick on myself. So I recently got an um, assistant professorship, tenure track, so it's still a hard way up. Uh, but yeah, I had a lot of failures. And actually, <laughs> the failures don't quite balance out so well with the success, right? And the question that we were asking in the, for this panel is uh, why do we tend not to talk about failures so openly? And if we talk about failures more openly, does it help? And it's true, in reality, I mean, uh, we find a lot of cards saying congratulations and stuff. But maybe it's about time that we also have sympathy cards like these. And I guess we would need, <laughs> thanks for Pierre Drakisevic, who would not join us, but he gave us this. But I think for every one positive, we would need three negative. <laughs> I would have appreciated those cards, I think, when I got the comments like, unfortunately, you are not yet good enough, or anyway. But in reality, I mean, failure, the idea of failure is not about just this, right? It's, it's basically, um, a natural thing it's a human thing and it's also very much into academia and uh, looking for example at Einstein he had quite a number of interesting quotes which thank you Sheila for <laughs> my the quote um, but yeah some interesting quotes like a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new right this is quite science if we don't try anything new I mean how are we going to come up with new scientific uh, research and life is like uh, riding a bike bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And that is uh, something we're going to discuss, endurance and motivation. And a ship is always safe at shore, but that is not what it's built for. And I guess, I guess that is what uh, scientists are built for, to go for risks, right? Um, so, right, so failure is part of life, but Sometimes, unfortunately, we are not, we are taught how to handle, take care of ourselves physically, but not quite well to, ha to handle our emotional state, especially when it comes to failures. And I guess everybody can relate a bit to this. And I guess also this picture you got fed up seeing quite a bit. But 
I guess everybody can relate to the fact that we are very excited, we are focused, and then paper rejection. Okay. And then your contract expires. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. And then something else happens and like you're out, basically. And this is not actually a chart we created. It's actually um, a chart that is uh, scientifically proven out there that actually uh, as the stress level, as you work harder and harder, the stress level increases and the performance is not going to increase at the end of the day. So we really have to be careful about this thing. Um, now, why did we decide to do the panel this year? Uh, <laughs> actually, this wasn't quite an expected panel for this. We just met Tatiana and I at Eurovis and we we're just chatting about this and we we're hearing about the Viz notifications and a lot of sad faces and stuff and we're saying, oh, maybe Viz rejection party, that would be nice. <laughs> and yes, we said, yeah, why not have a panel? And I told Tatiana, like, oh, you're crazy. I, like, it's in two weeks. And anyway, we were lucky because the extension, got, the deadline got extended. But why this year, right? So this year, actually, Nature published a whole series on this topic. Scientific areas and mental health. And a number of things came out of this. Okay, let's take a picture. <laughs> Just no, the board, the board. <laughs> uh, a number of things came out of this because then loads of articles, and these just like very few, but loads of articles every day, every week, Facebook, everywhere. These things were popping up, right? So PhD students have doubled the risk of developing psychiatric disorders. Mental health in academia is too often footnote and it's time to change. And some hard numbers in science, leadership problems. So there are problems in leadership. And actually what, it, what was interesting for me is that I noted that the, there were two things that came up. So one is the idea that we need to raise awareness that there is this problem that you could be in, burning out and then you should do something and therefore we need to teach the students and also teach ourselves to take care of ourselves. But another interesting thing that came up is this idea of leadership, that as, uh, as uh, supervisors or leaders we are not quite trained how to manage people, but typically we are, we are experts in our field. And being, I mean starting off my assistant professor, ex professorship, actually I felt quite a bit of responsibility. I said, ouch, okay, now I don't have to take care just of myself, but I have to take care of my students. Um, so, um, right, so these are a bit of negative comments, true, and especially this one, although it's quite an interesting point that it's about time to do a change. But in reality, actually, these articles led to also very positive things. And uh, later, uh, over the over the year, this year, um, there were a lot of articles like these, like how to write a thorough peer review and health tips for research groups, how to better to have more healthier, I mean, to nurture a better healthier environment research groups, how to help your team um, not to burn out. And then Yale had a very, very super successful course, which is this, which was about the science of well-being. And uh, they never had any, I mean, it's, it's like record. No, no other course has been so popular with the students. So this just rings a bell that actually, like even the students, they really want to learn more about this, right? So what are we going to talk about today? So as we said, this is not just a problem with, I mean, we're not saying that there's actually, I mean, we're just discussing it, but it's definitely a problem. There are challenges in academia. And we're going to discuss this in this because we are in the this community and we can't solve the world's problems, so, so to say. But we also want to brainstorm on how and whether the VIS community could do anything to support, uh, to support us in handling these threats. And we're talking about threats at, at different levels of um, um, seniority level, right? So uh, even like uh, as professors or young professors, you will need to start applying for grants, etc. Um, but the end goal is to further boost the health and productivity of our community and to support also those that are struggling with these threats. And uh, we really want to raise awareness that if you really need help, there is nothing wrong in asking for help. It's better to ask for help than to uh, not asking for help and things get worse. So, our nice panelists, we just invited them. They said yes. We didn't tell them actually what the details of what we want to talk about. They just wrote a position statement <laughs> and we didn't, right? 
I mean, just talk to the topic and that's it. <laughs> and it was very nice because then when they gave us a position statement, they came up with these different aspects. And then we grouped them up, we paired them up in, in this way. And this was very nice to see because it's very, it aligned very much with what we found in the research. Like there is a problem of reviews, uncertainties, scoping mechanisms, work-life balance, etc. So let me introduce you a bit with the, to the panel. So I will start first with Carla Schuber because nobody knows Carla Schuber. Carla Schuber is our psychologist. She's also a psychotherapist. She's also a yoga teacher. She's also a part-time researcher. She also has lots of hobbies. She also treats clients uh, who work in academia and she also has a private practice. And what else, Carla? <laughs> <laughs> she's she has a really she I, she's brilliant in balancing out her work life. So her list of um, expertise are quite long, but she's quite good in uh, balancing out uh, work and life. But above all, she is uh, a psychologist and she uh, she is a psychotherapist and she she treated people in academia who had su who have suffered from burnout. So we're very interested and thank you, Carla, for coming all the way from to help from Helsinki just for this day and the visit. I thank you all for coming, maybe to see Carla, not to us. Sorry, sorry to get that <laughs> Okay, I'm horrible in jokes, it's better if I don't say jokes. But next, we've got Sheila, and I'm so proud to have Sheila actually in the, in the, in the, in the panel, because I still remember my first visit 2009, maybe you don't even remember that, and I had the poster and uh, and I went back, I gave my fast forward, and I went back to my place, I didn't even know who this person that was talking to me was, because I was still new, and she told me like, good work, great presentation. Simple comment like that, that like made me so happy, and I didn't even know who I'm talking to. Obviously, when I realized it was Sheila, I was even happier than that. But yeah, I think Sheila is really good for this panel because she's very supportive um, to all students, besides having, as you see, loads of awards. Oh, shoot. Uh, yes, <laughs> right. And, uh, right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go through. Uh, right, and then we've got John Suska, I think most of you know John, and Nicholas, and uh, Liz, super brilliant panelists. Sorry, we're running out of time, sorry I didn't manage to introduce you all. But the program is going to be like this. I distributed some schedules, the schedules are also on the website. Uh, uh, as we go through the program, you can uh, leave your questions on Prezemo, which is basically you go to the website and then you click there. And uh, to show other rooms that we are not talking about very sad stuff, but we are talking about very cool stuff, you can also tweet and use that Twitter message. Uh, that's Prezemo. And uh, so yes, we're going to start basically with the topics. Then we're going to have the discussions, closing, and then we have the... Yeah, we've invited to the meetup. And now, yes, I'll give you the floor. So, hello and welcome. Uh, yes, I'm Carla Schubert. I'm a psychologist and a psychotherapist and a part-time researcher and a yoga teacher. And I will not so much talk about work and life balance, but rather about the risks associated to stress and time spans where this balance between work and life is not reached very well. Yes, and this function. Good. So, uh, yeah, there you see the main things I will talk about, what the work-life balance is and the risks associated to it. Depression and other psychological problems in PhD students and academ in academia uh, also in, with, with, with other academics and especially signs of depression and anxiety and uh, stress overload. So you all work in very competitive environment, I think, and your work in jobs, you needing a high qualification and an ability to be very good at many things at the same time. You need writing skills, analytic skills, uh, analytic thinking, patience, high level enthusiasm for your work. You should be uh, an organizational talent and, and, and. I think the list could go on and on. Uh, some of you like it more than others, I think. But the fact remains that all of you 
uh, to all of you it can be applied that the more articles you publish, the better uh, you are in your research career. Am I right? Okay, no laughter. I wrote, I was thinking now you're laughing, but you're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a very earnest community, I think, <laughs> dedicated to your jobs. So how does your balance then look like? Is it like this, the woman before, or is it like this? What's the reality in your life? I mean, best, as a psychologist, I would say the best would be that you have, you have time for your work, but then you have a lot of time also for your other things in life, for your private life, and also a time for yourself. But I think it's not like this, actually. I really think it's more than like this. Uh, and again, no laughter. So maybe this is your rea reality where you are. But I hope this is not the reality. <laughs> because when you're there, then that is really not good for your health. So I would want to talk a little bit more about stressors, what they do to your life. If you're very stressed, you have a lot of work to do and you have time pressure. And as a researcher, I think you owe a lot of you have uh, many, many times in your year you have time pressure to get the paper out, etc., etc. So it clearly influences your mood, it in influences your sense of well-being clearly, and it influences also your behavior, and it influences really also physiologically your health. I don't know if you're so aware about that, of that. So if you work too much, this is the result. Uh, I think some of you will think, okay, I need the stress and I manage very well and I love my job. And I can say that acute stress, uh, which is, which is uh, stress that, that is just for a short time, we need it all uh, and it helps us function. So it can be also in a healthy and a young individual uh, very adaptive and it's, it's, it's not really bad for you. But if the threat is unremitting and long term, the effects can really damage your health and they, they can produce physiological reactions that will end up in, in, in diseases. And uh, for example, diminished immune, immune resistance, sleeping problems, aches, heart diseases. I think this is something where some of you will also stop and think, okay, maybe I have to check my time schedule again. And then there's also the psychological side of it, uh, which is a lot anxiety, anxiety symptoms, like at, uh, you can feel very agitated at times, very restless. I think some of you know these feelings when you are writing an article or you, are, you want to get into a panel before a, before, a <laughs> before a conference and you have only six hours left and you'll try to write, write a proposal and then you feel restless, but then it's positive. But then when it stays with you for a long time, then it's really bad for your health. And uh, you can be also irritable, you can feel very low uh, emotionally, you don't have any interest in anything anymore, you, you, uh, you don't feel any, any more capable of doing your job, and um, sometimes you can feel also very isolated and you can use uh, for example, alcohol or other uh, drugs that you think they would could help you, but they are also very unhealthy, <laughs> clearly. And what's what's the point of all of that? I mean, in the end, you will lose your passion and your vision and your purpose in life. But what about the mental health problems? I mean, we saw in, Lu uh, in Luana's speech, she told us that we that there is a lot of research interest nowadays in in mental health in academia but still people don't talk to each other and uh, we know that over 35 percent have depressive or anxiety symptoms and and more than one of those symptoms and they really suffer but uh, they don't tell it openly so i think uh, that's the biggest problem that people don't talk they think it's a stigma and if you tell somebody you have mental health problems 
then you are not able to work anymore and this is not mm. true it can there can be phases you are not able to work but if you get help and if you get better uh, better ways of dealing with stress you can be perfectly able to work a lot longer than without this help so then I wanted to show you some hard data then uh, about about this uh, problem which is which is, seems to be bigger in academia than in the general general population the gray the gray bars are general population and the blue bars show you academic academics uh, in anxiety and depression and you see it's rather triple the the uh, size than in the general population and this is something we have to take seriously so science if you think about yourself the science could be in yourself that you feel more and more unhappy about the time devoted to work you neglect other other aspects of life you feel irritable, cry more, and lose interest. You eat more or, uh, or less than usual. You are dizzy and you sleep badly. And maybe it derives to uh, relationship problems and work uh, diminished workability. So, thank you very much, and I give the space to Sheila. Does this work? Oh, oh yes, it works. Good. Um, so, and this goes forward? Yeah. Yeah, so this point I will actually want to come back to at the end, and I'm going to try, do keep me on time because I don't want to go over, because I mostly want to hear your questions so we can have a discussion. Um, but I wanted to start talking a little bit about the original reasons for tenure, because when we think about this work-life balance, Right now, tenure has become to be this huge competition and um, huge stressor of so much that you have to produce. And initially, the idea of having a job that you couldn't be fired from was to allow people freedom and independence of academic thought. There was a recognition in the country as a whole that having people who could think what they felt like, even though other people might disagree, was important for the whole community. And I think we need to think about how much of that spirit we have managed to retain, and that this actually is a really important idea for the whole community. The next point is, I don't know how many of you have thought about unwanted knowledge. There's quite a bit, um, Ursula Franklin wrote quite a bit about it starting in the 80s. Essentially, there are certain types of research that you can get funding for. And so the community all gets, you know, tipped into certain types of research that are acceptable. And I think that we should be thinking about that if we are going for tenure and we want intellectual freedom. Like, how does this work out? Because um, I personally think that you really should be doing research that you're passionate about. Um, and that goes along with the original idea of tenure, but not so much along with the current mode and the current funding. Um, though I think that you know, what Carla said about the work-life balance, I mean, you can talk to my students, I'm a terrible person to be talking to you about work-life balance. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. <laughs> and they were all laughing here. Yes, it's totally true. And it is partly because I am doing what I am passionate about. Um, so that has its own risks. Yes, excellent to do what you're passionate about, but risky. Um, yes. Um, so coming back to the original uh, reasons for tenure, I don't think you should always be expecting agreement with all of your ideas, particularly if you're following something that you're passionate about that's maybe in some other area that is not maybe mainstream. Um, so when we submit and we get rejections or we get criticism or our friends disagree with us, you want to think about is that useful? I don't think you want to automatically swallow it. Like I think that um, 
sometimes even if you completely disagree with the criticism, it's going to be useful in that it's going to help you actually understand more clearly what it is you want to say and how it is you want to say it. Um, yeah, does it confirm your research direction? Oops, and I've gone on to the end. So then actually what I wanted to come back, I've got three minutes left, I'm not going to take them all, so we'll catch up in time. Um, I think, you know, I, I did a pal panel this year at CHI on um, the, the, uh, the continuing diversity in relation to gender issues, and CHI pays a lot of attention to this, and like how far we've come, and what we're trying to do, and where we're trying to go. And I know I was like totally blown away by the panelists, and how way further out there they were than I was, and listening to them was like really impressive. And one of the questions from the audience that resonates with me for this panel is, people said, Didn't, how can you possibly get this published? How did you start? And they said, what I had as the titles of this slide, is that when you get rejected, you know you're saying something important. <laughs> and that what you have to do is not change what you want to say, but try and think about how you can make it palatable so people will actually hear you. Okay, so I'm one of the two that will talk a little bit about reviews and rejections and so on. Um, and I feel that I'm kind of an authority on getting rejected. <laughs> I've uh, had uh, quite a few in my <laughs> in my life. I think my acceptance rate is abysmal, much lower than <laughs> conferences. Um, and when I was asked about this, I started thinking about my first submitted paper, horribly rejected, of course. It was a SIGGRAPH, and that was a mistake, of course, submitting the SIGGRAPH. But SIGGRAPH 2002, I was writing a paper on a project I'd done for my master's thesis. I was really proud of it. I had to print six copies and six copies of the VHS, or I, I actually an NTSC format, and put it in a box and ship it over. And you know that was the, the way we submitted papers then. I just got at the end of, of uh, that whole physical submission. And I sent it off knowing it would be accepted. And of course it wasn't, and it was rejected. It was actually pretty harsh reviews. And I'm not ashamed to say I started crying as soon as I found because I, I defined my entire career on that and my advice would try to console me but it was really rough. Um, I've had to do that to my students now of course. You know, um, we get rejected all the time as academics. We submit papers, we submit applications to jobs, we submit proposal for grants and most often than not they don't actually get funded or accepted or you get a position out of it. And I, you know, that experience is good. I've taken that to every time my students receive a rejection the first time. I sit down with them and I go through things and I have a box of tissues and we, we talk about them. We don't accept everything. Sometimes you say, you know, this might not be a fair comment. This is a fair comment and so on. It makes uh, people uh, better understand these things. So yes, rejections can be tough. It's really part of life, but we need to find coping me mechanisms to make this work. And uh, that's what I will talk a little bit about. One, the first coping mechanism that I have actually is that not to read the reviews, even if the paper is accepted. But you know, I, I have a hard time with reviews in general. But rejected reviews, you know, I look at the, we regret to inform you, and then I just okay, I'm going to do something else today, this week, this month, uh, because it is rough. <laughs> um, but then. The other thing also, you know, there's a temptation. You get a rejection and then you start thinking about your perceived competition. Um, other people that are doing a PhD at the same time or on the job market at the same time or, you know, trying to get their papers accepted at Viz. And it's so easy to go to Twitter or Facebook or check their web pages incessantly to figure out whether their paper got in. And that's not going to help you make feel any better actually. It's going to ruin your day. So that's, that's a good idea not to do. Try not to create this view of a competition and so on. I try to look at a rejection as an as a opportunity to have this almost 
ready paper that I can just do a little bit of changes to and then submit to a new venue and it's going to be much more likely to be accepted. So it sounds a little artificial, but think of it as an opportunity to resubmit somewhere new. And if you want something even more artificial, you can think of it as I'm actually helping the paper's co-chairs lower the acceptance rate <laughs> by having a rejected paper. I know, that's a little artificial, I agree, but someone has to be rejected, obviously, for an acceptance rate of about 25%, so obviously someone has to do this. Um, but another consolation is to say that eventually all papers, all good papers, will be accepted, so uh, if you go through the reviews with your advisor and you know you can say this these reviews may not be entirely fair or so on you typically know in your heart that you've done good work and if it doesn't get in the first time it eventually will so that's usually a consolation to keep in mind um, the dual of that is also realizing uh, reviews are not personal and also that you you are not defined by the papers you write which means I think it's a freedom because it means that I can just if I want to just delete that paper it's not going to define your future. No one will judge you for the work you did. So um, if I said that every paper eventually will be accepted, if you decide not to resubmit, you can start a new project and people are not going to hold you sort of responsible for rejecting paper, papers in the past. I want to finish up on you know things I've heard already and I know other panels will talk about. Being kind to yourself. Don't define yourself by your career. Try to have other things uh, that, you know, it, it, for uh, many of us, it's a, it's a, it is a job, first of all, for many of us. For many of us, it's a passion, definitely. It's a passion for me, that's what Sheila said. I agree with that, definitely. I can't believe I'm paid to do what I'm doing. But it, I don't think it should become an all-encompassing calling where your life is defined by a paper being accepted or rejected. And that easily happens, I think it's important uh, not to do. So uh, I have a little more notes on this. If you want to take a look at my blog post when I when they wrote the, when they wrote me to do this, I thought it was really cool. So I, I expanded my ideas a little bit further. But thank you. Okay, I'm going to cheat because if I don't use my notes, I'm going to forget something. <laughs> okay. So regarding. Paper and proposal rejections, I struggle with the same issues as everybody else. Instead of a personal story, I'd like to share with you a list of advice I've collected over the years about handling rejections of papers and proposals. Um, the reason is because nobody is exactly like me, so my story might not be helpful to you. Uh, the other reason is that I know my dual minority students do not have the same life experience as I do. All right? Hence the list of collected advice. Needless to say, please do as we say, not as we do, okay? All of us break the rules, we stay out all the time, okay? Do as we say. The first rule in handling rejections is to know that everyone fails. In 2016, Johannes Haushofer, who is no slouch at Princeton, put out a failure's version of his CV, which makes for a very enlightening reading. For each success we see, that person has failed multiple times. And I don't know if you can read his statement from all the back of the room. Most of what I try fails, but these failures are often invisible, while successes are visible. I have noticed that this sometimes gives the impression that most things work out for me. As a result, other people are more likely to attribute their own failures to themselves, rather to the fact that the world is stochastic, applications are crapshoots, and selection committees and referees have bad days. Right. Okay. Um, as Nicholas said, when you get a rejection, don't delve into the reviews right away. Do something nice for yourself that day, also as Nicholas said. A lot of my students do not know what being kind to themselves means. Okay? It means give yourself the same care you would give to a good friend. If you actually believe that beating yourself up makes you more successful, talk to Carla. <laughs> Also, say something encouraging to your students right away. Otherwise, they'll think you're disappointed in them on top of everything else. If you land on an instance of bad reviewing, it's okay to acknowledge that. But also say something hopeful, like, we're trying to improve that process. Otherwise, your students will learn that it's okay to do bad reviewing themselves. 
or words that they're doomed. While at it, teach your students what good reviewing looks like. Greg Turk has a wonderful brief guide in that respect. A few days later, see if you can organize a get-together in your geographical area. In Chicago, these folks at UIC, University of Chicago, DePaul, Northwestern, get together a week after reviews, come back to commiserate over beer. Thank you, Steve Harris. A couple of weeks later, go through the reviews, highlight with a marker positive comments, cross out all non-technical comments or bad reviewing instances and ignore them. If you can, get a mentor to read the reviews. Sometimes what looks like a hard rejection is actually a supportive review. Don't try to guess who reviewed your paper. It's bad for your soul. <laughs> <laughs> Anecdotally, we're also often wrong. Author X thought that reviewer Y as a primary had killed her paper. It turned out that Y wasn't even on the program committee that year. Don't wait a full year to resubmit to the same venue, in particular if you're on a tenure or graduation clock. Most prolific groups run a tight resubmission pipeline. Conference A, resubmit to conference B, resubmit to conference C. If a year has passed, resubmit to conference A. Speaking of which, always try to have three submissions in the pipeline and not at the same venue. That way rejection doesn't feel like they've killed your only child. Along the same lines, think of your first 100 papers. And if you have 100 papers, think of your first 200 papers. Okay? In that context, the current paper or proposal has very little weight. As Niklas said, don't compare. It's at the root of most misery. You're likely also not a good judge of how successful you appear to others. And this is an actual quote from a celebrated topologist with multiple C-graph papers talking to a visualization grad student saying, you have users who come to all your talks and can't wait to use your stuff. Do you have any idea how valuable that is? Last but not least, one thing I noticed about successful researchers is how fast they seem to recover from rejections and move on. I submitted again to a better venue and got the best paper award. Thank you, Jean Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to recap, as soon as you get the rejection, know that everyone fails. Be kind to yourself and to people who report to you. Learn to recognize bad reviewing and address it. About two weeks later, run a support group. Highlight the positives with a marker. Cross out the non-technical comments. Then ask a mentor to read the reviews. Long term, don't try to guess identities. Don't wait to resubmit. Always have free submissions in the pipeline. Don't compare yourself and recover faster. I did not come up with this list all by myself. About a third of it comes from Francesca Gaiba at my home university, um, the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, and the rest of the thirds come from my personal cheerleaders and mentors. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> this, this was not how, how we thought that uh, the water would be, but anyway. So I'm, I'm not Daniel, as you can see. I'm, I'm Helwig Hauser from the University of Bergen. And I want to share a few loosely connected thoughts with you that possibly are a little controversial also, and, and that hopefully can give rise to some questions later, which I I'm looking forward to. So, to start with, I, I want to say, I think in, in, in my heart, I, I am a little bit an explorer. I like to go to new places and to, to take some risks doing so also. And, and that is what, what I want to focus on here a little bit. So, we have heard over and over that failure is omnipresent in what we are doing. It's everywhere. And every one of us experiences a lot of failure all the time. And the question is really not whether or not we fail, it's much more whether we get up again and try again. 
So this is what at least I try to, to tell my students that uh, everyone gets knocked down. The question is only how you get up again. And I, I may also say I, I don't have the time, I think, to, to read all of the quotes here, but, but while preparing for this few minutes, I found so many quotes that address this, this topic that I wanted to share them with you also. So in the PhD comics that I really love and I, I can very much recommend to everyone because I mean they, they give you a mirror uh, to, to how your life is as, as an academic. Uh, here in this example it says, well, you've only failed twice, fail eight more times and then get back to me. So <laughs> I also like the quote by Samuel Beckett that ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. <laughs> One has to think about this. So. One reason for all this failure is that I think we are facing very high expectations and um, the, this starts much higher than on a personal level. So usually the institutions we are working for, they are under pressure uh, from the politicians and from the fund uh, givers uh, that there should be, I don't know how many science or nature papers, ERC grants, Nobel prizes, etc., etc. And that pressure trickles down on, on the individuals uh, tenure track researchers, PhD students, you name it, we all feel that. And I have the impression it's, it's, it's getting also a little harder in our field. Uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, I had the experience we had a much broader spectrum of conferences, like top range, second range, uh, third range, and so on. And everything be below the top is seem, seeming to die out these days. So everyone needs to go to WIS. There is no alternative. I think, I'm not sure this is the, the optimal development. And also like in the, in the early days of the WIS conferences, you could get through with a, with a good paper that is not perfectly written, that, that doesn't look super shiny and so on and so forth, which just had a really good idea. That is also very hard these days. So we, we need top-notch paper standards, crit critical reviewers. I, I will never forget what an NSF officer said to me in 2005 at a workshop in Utah. Uh, reviews in computer science, they don't review, they debug. <laughs> it made me think and I will not forget this. So the thing is that we, we, we are facing a competition that, that, that we can't deny. It's just there. So if you are a plumber, then you compete with a couple of other plumbers nearby and local rules apply, labor rights apply in a very practical way. We compete on a worldwide level and we can't really rely on, on labor rights so really, only theoretically. So in this PhD comics, I, I think it's very interesting what comes out at the end, like the professor doesn't even want to know about personal issues because that would look make her look like a real person. So what is it then that brings us forward? I think we, we have to look at motivation and we have already seen this before and I very much believe in that, that pioneers, I mean, they are driven by their passion. When Roald Amundsen raced for the South Pole, he, he didn't think about a nine to five, <coughs> nine to five schedule. So when, when, in, when, when you are a pioneer, Factors like money or you know, calculated future opportunities, they don't work very well as motivation. And I, I think if, if you want to, to stay healthy and successful in this uh, environment, you better follow your heart and, and, and be driven by your passion. There is hope uh, that you can make up for quite a bit. Uh, I like this quote by Thomas Edison, that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% pers perspiration. So uh, that says something. So you, you, you don't need to be um, a, a real genius all from the beginning. You can do up uh, for a lot with hard work. Uh, there is a question how, how to do that, how to do hard work. Well, I, I think one rule that I try to follow is you, you also should celebrate hard and then, I mean, it should be fun. On the other... <laughs> That's me. Is that slide? Is the slide so, missing? Several. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> best, best example of, of, of failure. So, uh, let me see. Uh, I, 
I, I, I can make some um, more comments. I had a conclusion actually, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the conclusion was that that I, I think you we should we should follow our heart and we should listen to 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 what it tells us. We should make decisions early. We should be also realistic and we should find our place. Mm -hmm. You don't. Not everyone needs to be an ERSR, uh, ERC grant winner, but you can also be very happy in, in an industrial R&D, for example, so we can choose our places also, and, and that, uh, I think, um, may, may help us to be happy after all. Yeah. So, with, without further ado, I give the microphone to Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Howard. So uh, maybe halfway through my talk, we find the remainder of Helwig's slides. <laughs> so um, I'm changing gears a little bit. We saw a contract expiring, and the title of my talk is, Will I Be a Postdoc Forever? So here's a, a list of the four institutions that I studied uh, at, uh, and for a good four years, I was on fixed-term contracts and talking a little bit about that. So first, a little bit of uh, local culture. So for those who don't know Dylan Thomas, he's a Welsh poet. I took this picture on, on the way to work, just walking. Um, he's a famous person in Swansea University. Uh, he wrote a poem for his dying father. Anybody see the movie Interstellar? Yeah. The entire poem is read from beginning to end in Interstellar, which is kind of amazing. It's a nice poem. Uh, and the second last line of it is, do not go gentle into that good night. Quite frequently, uh, he didn't want his father to die. Um, but uh, in this sense, don't give up. Okay, so surprisingly enough, I'm Canadian. Once uh, John Statsko asked me at a Dijkstuhl, okay, Dan, where exactly are you from? <laughs> I grew up in Ottawa, Ontario, did my undergrad at Queen's, postgrad at UBC, finished my PhD in 2008, and then some stuff happened. I finished my PhD in Vancouver, then there was the 2008 financial crisis. Moved to Bordeaux, Eurozone crisis. <laughs> Moved to Dublin, Ireland, IMF bailout. Moved to the United Kingdom, guess what? Brexit. <laughs> so my abilities to cause national economic meltdowns and unrest are astounding. Um, correlation does not imply causation. I don't actually believe that I can destroy economies. And so, uh, therefore, I think I'm not the only one. So I see lots of people on fixed-term contracts in the UK and internationally. Some of this instability is built into the job that we've chosen. The postdoc system is quite natural in North America. Uh, in countries such as German, Germany and Austria, it's also built into the system as well. Uh, currently, uh, with economic instability, it means that most institutions want to minimize risk, and it's not only in academia, but it's perhaps a, a function that's a little bit more global. So, what I say is enjoy your instability. While I was in the uh, position of not knowing what country I was going to be in within a year and a half, I found solace in the fact that I could learn about new cultures, actually live in a country, actually see how that country worked, and I think my career and my life is, is richer because of it. Having long-term targets and short-term goals. So, quite frequently, how the heck am I going to finally get that tenure-track job? How the heck am I going to get that permanent job? Well, if you think of all of that at once, you're just going to fall apart. So, okay, I concentrate on this paper, I concentrate on this application. That gets rejected, where do I submit it to next? So don't look at everything at once, instead set smaller uh, more manageable goals. And do the cool things uh, that you like to do, and take the risks uh, necessary, necessary to do that. From the other side, as a postdoc, you will have so much time to uh, focus on your search. So uh, be, be happy that you have the, the, the privilege to think for very, very long periods of time. I have to say, funding applications take time. They're fun as well. And teaching administration is fun. I'll admit that teaching can be fun sometimes. Uh, administration 
sometimes uh, I, I need a little bit more motivation for that, but it, it all stems from the fact that I really like the research. And I'm very happy that uh, I had the experience that others have not, and the experience of living in four countries. My motivation, I think we should live up to our potential, so don't give up. A positive contributions can come in many ways, and it's up to you to decide uh, which way you would like to make that contribution. In my case, uh, it was continuing on in academia. Uh, therefore, embrace your challengers, but please, always be sure to be doing the things that you enjoy the most. So my wishes for the futures, uh, we live in a very competitive environment. Many of us are driven people, many of us has clear goals that we want to attain. Uh, I suggest you, you follow those goals and understand that you may fail along the way. However, it's really important to make extra opportunities that might be seen as sidetracks at the same time. Help that undergrad, postdoc, PhD student who is lost. Take risks on ECRs and give them responsibility. And you also have a, 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 an opportunity uh, really to make a difference uh, in other people's lives. And with that, do not go in gentle into that good night. Thank you. Yes, so it's easier for me to talk when I'm standing, and I hope you see me also. And um, the seconds are running. I'm feeling sweat. <laughs> no, no. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit about coping mechanisms, support and self-help, but I also wanted to do um, something with you at the end of my short speech today. So I will run through those slides. I hope you can, do you have them somewhere available for people if they are interested? Yeah, so the slides are important, but not as important. I think I can give you more if we do something together. But I want to comment, I think it was Helvig who was talking about the pioneers and the passion and Sheila too, and I agree, you need passion to do your work, and you, you can think about the passionate pioneers working all the time, and that's, maybe that sounds very nice, but changes in our time, I mean, there happened a lot of changes, and today we are working rather differently than before. If I think about passionate pioneers 100 years ago, they needed to stop chopping wood, making dinner, something like that, or at least telling the servants to do that. <laughs> so you had to have some breaks, and nowadays you don't really need them, because you can order your food home, you can work incessantly, so I think it's all the more important today that you think you need some pauses. Yeah, that's what it says. So it, the work really bleeds into your personal life and it blurs the boundaries and boundaries are important. So what can we do to reduce uh, self-care? Uh, to reduce stress? <laughs> this is a Freudian. <laughs> so if you think about yourself uh, and you, you, you think you have to try understand yourself better on an individual level and you need to find out how you can tune out of your work. And on a general level, it can be taking holidays, and doing physical exercise, developing and holding on to hobbies and relax. But during working hours, you can also have power naps, try to implement some work gratitude moments do some breathing exercises or make short walks around the institute maybe 
change your environment for lunch, just to have to think about something else a short while. And when self-care is not enough, then you should try psychological counseling, and I'm serious about that. Psychotherapy, I understand, maybe there are people who really think, no, I never want to go to a psychotherapist. But a psychological uh, counselor or a psychologist can help you find out if it could be helpful or what you need, you know, to tune out of your stress level. So, uh, what you can do uh, as a supervisor and uh, with the research group, there are a lot of things you can do, there are a lot of papers out even about this issue, the feedback work roles, the positive problem solving, I think it's more about uh, you also wanting to do this stuff and uh, wanting to uh, make your research group a good group, a, well, uh, a, good, a group with um, possibilities to be healthy, stay healthy for a long time. But what I want to do now is, I please stand up, all of you, if I may ask you. So, stand up, all of you, and if you want, close your eyes. You don't need to do that, but if you want, close your eyes. Next, what I want you to do, put one hand on your breast area, somewhere um, on the heart, and the other put on your navel. On your navel, <laughs> down there, stomach area, okay? Yeah. And try to stand on both feet your weight nicely, nicely on both legs, so you will not fall any direction. And now we start breathing together. So if you can, close your mouth, breathe in, uh, breathe in through your nose, take a nice breath, breathe a uh, breath in, try to feel the air in your breast. Try to feel the air down to your stomach. Hold it there one moment, no longer. Breathe it out again. And then do it again. Listen to your heartbeat. Feel the air circulating in your body. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> and that's, it, that's all it takes. Thank you very much. I just want to say, I hope you can take this gem away and use it sometime, if you feel really very, very stressed or at the brink of depression. So I really hemmed and hawed with what to say here, and I just heard a bunch of wonderful wisdom, and in light of that, I've decided to go rogue. <laughs> so my advice to all of you junior researchers, quit the whining and get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't laugh, there's a problem. Okay. I, I was not serious in that, and hopefully that points out the level. But I, so I do want to talk about three things, reviewing uh, communities of cohorts and work-life balance. Uh, so reviewing, lighten up folks, okay? It, it just, let's be nicer to each other and much more encouraging. I'm a big karma believer. You view something positively, it'll come back. Um, but you have to watch. Recently, uh, this year, you know, I say these things, but I, I was on a grant review panel, and the program manager looked at all of the reviews, and he read some of mine, and he looked at some and said, you know, you said this was very vague. Did you need to say the very there? It felt like you were piling on a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He said, you, you wrote the PI, da-da-da-da. That's kind of personal. You know, say the proposal did this, whatever. So 
think think carefully about how you write things and what it, it, it's really good good advice and uh, one thing let's all agree I, I want to get kind of a you know reviewing what it's all about you should never ever write a review that you would not be willing to print out sign your name on the bottom walk up to the authors and hand it to them you know if you if, look at your review if, if you think you don't want to do rewrite it okay because you should be able to do that okay we want to be objective and get at all of that uh, communities of cohorts find some folks who are kind of like you I, I actually know about primarily through my colleague Alex I think the junior viz uh, professors researchers have kind of a group and a slack channel and they get together and I've heard wonderful things try to find something like that I heard about the Midwest uh, set of folks uh, I mean, even us old fogies, uh, the, Viz, the Viz Pioneers group, although when we meet, we talk about how our back hurts and our eyes are going. <laughs> so it's a, it's a different set of things we moan about, but, you know, life changes as you get older. Uh, the third one, work-life balance. Um, so the toughest thing that I deal with, and this has not gotten any better, and it just kind of gets worse, I, I feel like... I'm juggling 23 balls in the air, you know, at any, any one point in time, you got to get that grant, and there's deliverable, right? You got to get that out and get that proposal in. And I feel like a lot of times there are things that I wish I had a little more time and I'm not doing it as well as I'd like to and I want to do, but it just, you deal with that. So, you know, I'm culture a life outside of, of academia or your job and community. I think that's really, really important. Have hobbies that are outside. Get a, get away. Take that time. I actually think, you know, people are oh, don't. I think I do that. Okay, if any of you know, I care about golf more than I care about. But, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, find find things to go out. Find friends and relationships who are not other computer scientists <laughs> and <laughs> academics and people outside. I think that's really important to talk about kind of your third self and and these communities that are different than, than what you really work in. And when, when things don't go well, you, you know, you got to laugh at it a, a little bit. And, and some stuff is just because, you know, other, otherwise it'll, it'll kind of break you down. So, so find ways to kind of look at it, reflect back. Uh, your job's what you do, not who you are. Keep that and just kind of push on forward with that. Please thank all the panelists. Yes, yes. Please thank all the panelists for their great contribution. And um, we had a wide range of topics and views on, on this topic. So we would like to ask you whether you have any questions or you can even put your questions on the anonymously on the Prezemo. Okay, so we can can you read the first question from Okay, so I think we have we can start reading some questions from Prezema until people until people decide to speak up and I will open Prezema now. Uh, but can you say the first question? <laughs> right, so So how can I remain focused and motivated after failure? Who of the panelists wants to answer that? Do you know what they have an answer, panelists? Sure. <laughs> I'm going to say we've had everyone. Yeah. Right. And, um, essentially, I would say three quarters of what people have said has been about that a whole bunch of like lists of advice yeah. about how to remain positive. But really, yeah, I don't know that I really want to go through that whole list again, but I think yes. the thing is, is that it's just a review. It's not everything. Um, and there will be lots of them, and lots of them will be no's. And uh, you can't, like, hang everything on that. And I think that the list of, like, little, you know, that Nicholas and Liz, Liz gave a very good list. Um, have a look at those. Take them to heart. Actually do them. Yeah. So actually, yeah, we can put all the material online, so uh, yeah. we'll keep the website updated. 
Right, so I'm not sure. Oh, okay, some updates. <laughs> okay, so how do you cope up with peer pressure in a lab? Did we discuss that? Not quite? I don't know if I have a solution for it, but I, I can synthesize because I remember being a PhD student and I had two colleagues in my room that were in the same research group and I just saw them. They were they were doing well, they got papers accepted. I, I remember sitting there. They started at the same time and I was just knew that my colleagues had two or three papers accepted and mine just kept getting rejected. I'm not sure entirely what I would say, how to cope with it. it might be the advisor's role to talk about, talk to the students, you know, and in, in, in my case, uh, my advisor did tell me, you know, your colleagues work in a different field and you are working something, he wasn't even a visualization person. So I can't help you as much, and it made sense. But um, in the end, um, you know, it's your PhD, it's your own race, just not checking your competition, even if it's in the same room as you're sitting, as it was in my case, that's not very helpful. I know, for example, one of these people that I work with, one, one of my friends still, he was working very late hours. I would come in on a Saturday to pick something up, and he was there. He says, st stayed to 10 p.m. on a Friday. In the end, you know, um, it doesn't really matter. Everyone has their own uh, work approach, and the acceptances and rejections ebb and flow. Okay, thank you. So maybe we can take a question from the audience. Yeah, Bob. Thank you all. It's uh, Bob Laramie from Swansea University. Thank you all for a great, great panel. I don't even, I don't have a question. Well, I could try to formulate a question, but it's more of a comment. From my own perspective, I've recently introduced a technique as an advisor for PhD students, and I actually like have a talk with them before the notifications are sent out. So I say, like, I have a big warning for you. You know, 75% of these papers get rejected. And statistically speaking, your paper is going to be rejected, so you have to be able to <laughs> handle that when the day comes. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I've been doing, and I, I, I think it's a great thing, actually, and um, I think it's helped. And, and, I, and I say some of the things like, it's fine to cry about it for a few days, and that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll both cry for a few days. But then, at some point, we have to like move, get up and move on after after that happens. And uh, I wondered if you guys have some strategies like that, or strategies that try to reconcile the successes with the failures in the same group, because that's kind of a tricky aspect as well. I mean, you don't want to celebrate a success too much in front of the other failures, so to speak. Maybe I, I may a short comment. Thank you, Bob. I think one thing is share your failures with your with your PhD students or whoever works with you. I mean, uh, and and laugh about them also. I think uh, considering also the, the the question we had before uh, in a group peer pressure. I think also the opposite is true. That you know, if you're in a group, you see that the others fail as well, and then and make a rejection party after after a big deadline. I I think sometimes just bringing it down on the ground and, and looking at it from a little distance with a little bit of humor can, can help a lot. So That's what I, I actually I would get to echo, echo the point about trying to actually have a little bit of humor about it. Yeah. I think the point that somebody made about uh, that it's, you know, 75% of papers or sometimes more um, are going to be rejected. So the odds that you're going to be in that 75% are higher than <coughs> you're going to be in the 25%. So, yeah. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the quote about uh, life is in motion, you know, life is like riding a bicycle, you know, see, so you, you have to kind of uh, let it go and uh, keep moving. Right. You know, work, work with, you know, look at what you can gain out of the reviews, nearly always, even if they are like really negative and occasionally get a really negative one, there will be something useful in it. So try and actually find the positive and uh, 
try and think about where you're going next and try and you know, help the students in general to feel like it's not the end of the world. I think John wants to say something. So jealousy is a really human emotion and it's maybe not the best one but we all kind of kind of deal with that in this lab putting it all together you you want to try as best as hard as you can to be you know genuinely happy for your colleagues when when they succeed and and things go well because you like to have that flipped around kind of the other way it's just i think it's something you have to work at it, it's hard and try to be kind of a, a you know a better person be genuinely happy for the the success of others and uh, you know the rising tide does raise all boats and and uh, it, it'll come back to you so so i'm saying that on present can i just add one thing oh sorry, sorry the nicest thing i've heard very soon after i arrived at my new institution was whenever somebody got the grant the other people in the department said congratulations your success is our success okay. nicest thing ever yeah. so, uh, so uh, we have can you wait a minute Enrico because we have a question here that's been like beeping up and I think it we should discuss it so how did seniors manage a work-life balance when starting a family that's we go on I guess who wants to answer I think most people are still moderately junior in an academic career when they do uh, start a family okay so now you're senior but how did you do it when you were junior <laughs> I guess so well when, when when I was doing this when I had small children I was actually I had no computer at home I kept work at work right. I've got much worse <laughs> as I've gotten older but uh, yeah I, I went you know I went home and I had no computer because I spent that time with my kids and I knew that that was the easiest way of doing it, to just not have it there. Um, but, um, and I think that when you have kids, that's like super important. Um, and I, yeah. Liz wants to say something, yes? Or, yes? My son is 21 months old, so um, I've found it was very concentrating and focusing <laughs> to become a father because as soon as I come home I know I'm not gonna work and when he goes to sleep then I can work I'm not gonna spend a lot of time just watching TV or playing games when I know I have to do something so in a way um, um, I'm not sure that's really helping because it says that I'm working outside of hours but I typically tend to go home earlier so I spend time when he's awake so I actually think I'm I work a little more disciplined uh, in having a family Most of the people I admire in academia carve out specific time for family. And that time is as holy to them as skipping a class they teach is. Okay? You're not going to cancel picking up your child from school, just like you wouldn't cancel class. Uh, there's something else that Randy Pausch once said. He said, um, spending a weekend around the house without email or web access is more vacation than going to Hawaii <coughs> for 10 days with email. Okay? So how you protect your time for your private life is really important. Randy Pausch also said, call me up in my office at 10 p.m. on a Friday night. I'm not sure it's a great, great example. I think I, I should be the advocate of failure here because uh, there should be also a voice raised for those who probably cannot answer positively to this question, it's especially if my wife should answer uh, yeah. this question for me, she probably would say, not at all. I mean, yeah. I would try to explain to you, yes, I took some time off and I tried to have quality time and what not, but I think there's also an objective perspective that, that um, I mostly failed. Yes. There is, I mean, I don't know if in the HCI community, which is not all that different from the VIS community, I don't know if any of you know, Carl got one, but on a podcast, he had this really infamous quote. He said, being an academic is wonderful, um, 
you know, hours are totally flexible. You can work any 80 hours of the week you feel like. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, it would be interesting maybe to get Carla's perspective of this, like because we're all like in academics. So, do you have a comment, the baton? I was just waiting for the other questions. I think burnout is more my specialty, but sure, I can t say something. I mean, I think nowadays, I mean, you have to, nowadays, I mean, you see, at least you do see more men on the streets with small children and their babies, so I think it's more gender equal, at least in Europe and maybe in US, Northern Europe especially, but even in Japan, one of my, the countries I love, I see more and more young men with their kids outside, and I think that's beautiful, but what I wanted to say, you have to really think about what's important in your life. And having children, raising them is a long-term goal, you know? So maybe sometimes, I mean, it, if a child is gets ill, there's no, 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 uh, you don't need a calorie for that, you have just to be there for this child of yours. So I think that's just, uh, you have to change your priorities in life, that's it. So I, th I think that um, we like to pretend that we have equality, um, but even, well, it, it's quite different trying to do this as a woman as trying to do it as a man. And a lot of the differences are small and subtle. Um, a lot of the differences come from the work-life balance problem, but a lot of the differences actually get piled up for um, even attempts to create gender equity, which pulls more demand on women where there are less in the field. And um, that's a really hard thing to deal with, and it's a really hard thing for me to watch when I have lots of my students are now profs, male and female, and I can see the women having a harder time. It's almost easier to see that than to see it for me. They have more demands, both at home and at work, generally. And, <coughs> yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult thing, but maybe it's something that all of you can think about in the small, if it's just a little small thing that you notice that you can change to try and help that balance, that would be cool. I just wanted to add one trivial thing here. Uh, my kids are 18 and 17 now, and once they're born to you, they don't wait for you. So I think this is something that we, we sometimes think only this next one deadline, only this next one paper, and then everything will be better. And I, I don't know how often I told my wife, only this one deadline and then everything will, be, will get back better. Your kids don't wait, and time flies. 18 years is a short time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, now, sorry, Enrico, I have to wait. It's okay. So, yes. Except that I have back pain. <laughs> John, I'm already the part of the club. <laughs> I'm too young for that. So I'm Enrico Bertini from New York University. So first of all, I want to I wanna thank you. I think that's a hugely important topic. And um, yeah, I'm just coming out of, of tenure and uh, it's been a massive psychological pressure um, without counting being a postdoc and a PhD student previously. So um, yeah, I can. Um, I came to this panel because I can. I can definitely say I've been struggling, and I'm still struggling with a lot of these these problems. And uh, it's hard to talk about them, and it's hard to even talk about them with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, amazing. I, I think it's it's a great event. Thanks for organizing it. I just wanted to. Um, I don't have a question. I just want, I just have a comment about the idea of failure. Um, we talk a lot about failure. I want to suggest that we, we talk about failure and success, right? So we were always thinking about, oh, we have to be successful and I'm failing because I'm not successful under these parameters. 
I think we need some of that because we need to deal with reality, right? That's how we are judged. Whether we like it or not, there is a system out there that ranks us according to these parameters and we can't just not deal with it. But on the other hand, sometimes when I, I do get requests from younger professors who just started and they say, so what should I do? Should I write this grant, write this paper, grow my group, do this, do that? And normally the advice that I give is you should first think about how to grow, right? So I would love to hear more about growth because I think here we have to start from the assumption that we are in a very unique position, right? We are highly educated. Uh, we are all either working on a PhD or, or have a PhD already. We are typically in very wealthy countries. So it's a luxury to be dealing with these kind of problems. And I think it's much more useful to think in terms of growth, right? Because when you think about growth, I think there are a number of aspects that are really useful about the growth mentality. Um, I have notes here, but first, of, first one is you never stop growing, right? So it doesn't matter at what stage of your life you are, you still need to grow. Everyone here still needs to grow, right? So the second one is that failure is defined by others, but growth is easier to define by yourself. You look internally and it's like, how should I grow next, right? And the last one is, um, as I said, <coughs> failure is short term, right? It's this single paper, this single deadline, but growth stays there forever. So I think it's useful to think in terms of reflecting about yourself and saying, how can I grow? And again, when you look at things under this perspective, at least it's been very useful for me. I get this grant rejected, it's like, okay. Or even writing a grant, right? I don't want to write a grant because it's going to be another failure. I don't want to write the next paper because it's going to be another failure. But once you see it under the lens of growth, it's like, I don't care what the outcome is going to be. It's an, another opportunity for me to grow. And I think that's a useful mentality, a useful yeah. mindset. That's the only thing I wanted to say. So actually, what you said, I think um, yeah, it's very valid. And uh, I think this should not stop here. I mean, it was just an experiment, actually, just to see how things go and how the community takes it. But yeah, I mean, I would suggest that if you can have time, let's sit down, meet up, or meet up if you can't make it to the meet up later this week, so we can decide on what we can do events later on. Because even just talking about these problems is very helpful. So, yes, Charles. Hi, I'm Charles Perrin from the University of Victoria. Um, my question is related to so, succeeding by failing is the title of the of the panel, but so we, it's very identify, but easy to identify failure. I think it's much more difficult to identify success. <coughs> At least I have trouble with that. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a failure, I wouldn't say I'm successful either. So do you have ways or advices uh, regarding how we can as individuals convince ourselves that we have a certain degree of success and how do you measure that even for yourself? Like, because there is no end. You know, if you aim for the star, you will never reach the star anyway. So where, where do you stop? How do you put limits on, on the success you are trying to achieve? So I, I think in some ways, so for me, it really actually matters not just the publication, but that what I do, do actually has some impact in the world. Um, I've over and over again take on projects that actually I've been told like before, oh, that's career suicide, you shouldn't be doing that, you won't get publications out of that. Um, it's true. For some of them, I haven't got publications. <laughs> there are some of them that um, I haven't even tried to publish because I know it's not what our community wants to, but, but have had real impact. And actually, even this morning, it was nearly always all those projects that I picked because those are the ones that have actually gone out into the world. So in some ways, the, we measure our success and failure for paper counts. That hasn't been the way it feels for me. Um, actually feeling like I've made a difference occasionally has been more sustaining. It's made it more possible, um, as you actually know very well, we have lots of failures in my lab. This happens a lot. Um, and part of it is because I don't take, I don't, so 
I approach research from the question that I am interested in, because I think the interest and the passion is what matters. And that doesn't mean, sometimes I even know this is unlikely to be a question that the community is interested in. And I do then have to try and think about how to talk about it so that they may see what I find interesting, which is really challenging. I mean, it's much easier to go the other way, to say, here's a question, and how can I formulate it in a way that the community will recognize it? So, personally, I think it's been more important to stay with what I find intellectually and socially compelling, and that the pub to try and actually let the publication be secondary in what I do. So I was going to say, well, not, maybe not so eloquently, something similar. <laughs> um, but to add um, on top of that, I, I, I'm a big fan of, okay, so you identified failure, you can almost flip it on his head, okay, now I have an opportunity to take a next step. <laughs> So yeah, this paper has been failure. What are the three things that I can, this paper has been rejected, what are the three things I can do next? So instead of dwelling on the fact that it was rejected, say, okay, I'm going to submit it to this place and then I'm gonna run this interesting experiment because I find it cool. And just sort of concentrate on what to do next and almost forget that the failure happened. Does that help or hurt? <laughs> uh, no, n neither. I don't. I, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> Let me say, babe. <laughs> Sorry? No, no. I was just saying it's it's not really what I had in mind. It was because it doesn't help me measure. Uh, so. Am I successful and satisfied in my success? Like you know. Well, if the, you're taking a next step, I think you're successful. How do I know that? How do I know I am? Because you are taking the step. <laughs> So, did I answer the question? So let, me, let me say it this way. I don't feel any different than I did when I was a, just a little postdoc visiting this for the first time in 2007. I don't feel any different, but of course there are objective measures that says something about your career that you can look at. Uh, I do feel different. Uh, a little, and it, it just, things, things go on. I, it's a great question because I think it's easy to kind of overlook those successes, right? You send those four papers and three got in and I forgot about those, but that one that didn't really ticks me off, you know, yeah. And, and it's just human nature again. Uh, it just said, you know, yeah, you have to cut yourself a break. I, I, I think that, uh, again, one way to see that success is maybe having a good cohort, a group, a good group who do appreciate, you know, the, it, it, it's a it's a community, you know, kind of appreciation there, and and some of that, I, I think it's hard for it all to be internal. I, I, I'm just being a realist. I think there has to be some external recognition and and so on uh, to to have that. So try to put yourself in situations where where that can happen. But it's a good question, Charles. I know you're successful. <laughs> I do it. So, so my understanding is that you you forget that, okay? And people who forget that one technique is you have a drawer in your desk, and you stash little notes of your successes. And the day you're feeling really down, look at some of those notes. Charles, I wrote you a reference letter. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to comment and I would really say that I would ask you, I would want to ask you if you would consider yourself very successful, would you be happy? I have no idea. <laughs> Why don't you think about this? I mean, what does it need for you to be happy? Because you can, I mean, that's the point in research, you can, I mean, success, 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 you cannot measure it. There can be hundreds of papers. I was wondering today when Liz said that the first hundred papers, and I was thinking, oh God, 
<laughs> what about the first 10 papers? I mean, where are you guys? 100, 200, 300 papers, okay, that's, I mean, I'm a psychologist, but it would be a lot. So, I mean, thinking of your success and not being successful or successful, you should ask yourself, what, is there anything else to life? How do you, what do you like about your research? What do you like about your research? What, what do you like about doing this? Because then I think you get more to, you get more connected to this feeling of being internally successful, you know? Thank you. Okay. Next question. Uh, Fanny Chevalier from University of Toronto. So I want to echo um, the thank you to uh, the organizers and panelists for this uh, very useful discussion we have. I think I have two questions. Uh, the first one is I recently uh, rejoined uh, university as an assistant professor and uh, there's a lot of things and a lot of demand that requires me to have this content constant uh, context switch which I find very exhausting and relating to the graph that we saw before I think if not already I've reached the fatigue uh, kind of step and it seems to me that it's much easier to fall down the hill rather than crawl back up. So I think I would like to hear your thoughts or maybe practical advice on how to get back on the left hand of, of this chart rather than uh, having things slip uh, on the wrong direction. I actually think that that is very key, the whole question of context shifting. I think people don't realize how much that is in the life of uh, an academic, a professor, is forever context shifting. You know, for every student you have, for every committee you're on, for every class you teach, you know, and if you have 200 students in that class, it's, you're always context shifting. And they walk in and they expect you to remember them and their problem and what they talked to you about last and all the rest of that. And it's, um, I remember when I first came to be a prof, one of the other profs made a joke about himself talking about a little anecdote for himself at home about how he was, you know, he couldn't context shift and he just got into complete, and it was, it was really quite funny, but it was very personal. Um, but it made me think about it. And there are actual context shifting techniques. I mean, so Carla gave us one little exercise, um, but essentially, you know the Zen notion of an empty hand? No. no. If you, uh, so, with an empty hand, you can grasp anything. So the analogy is that you would like your mind to be empty, because then it can grasp anything. And that's kind of counter to all of the academic training that we've had, where we've <laughs> stuffed our minds full of things, right? So now, you have to learn how to put down, because actually, you can't pick something else up until you can put down. And it's a new skill, and there are, um, there are techniques that will help you learn that. Um, I know that for myself, I, this is like a hugely important part of how I manage and still enjoy it and still feel like um, work is play, like um, you know, I can't believe that they pay me. I don't think of it as going to work every day. I think, oh, what will I do today? Um, but there's two things, and one is I do practice putting things down intellectually, and I rely on everybody else to set the new context. I mean, even if it's just when they come into my office, or I say yes, and they will. They'll set the context for you. But you have to practice emptying your mind. And I want to add that for, for this, for example, for this uh, skill, you also could use the help of a psychologist. <laughs> I'm, I want to tell you all, I mean, psychologists are in every city, I think, <laughs> where you live, <laughs> at every university, and I'm wondering why nobody uses them. I mean, they are skilled professionals. So please contact them and they help you. I mean, they are there give you their professional skills. 
I mean, it costs a little bit, but very little. And they have, they have a lot of knowledge about how to shift your context and how to relax more and how, for example, there was one, one um, question at Presemo, I want to say, I want to say it out loud. I am so bad at making new friends and felt very anxious to find someone to chat with, especially in a conference like this. And can a person with poor social skills survive in academia? And there were a lot of people who wanted to ask this question. And I think, I also recommend go to a psychologist. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you also use a dentist, I hope, don't you? <laughs> so, do yourself that favor. There's one comment from John, and we have only so five minutes left. So we can ask questions about what skills make a uh, successful, you know, how creative, they're a good writer, they're good. Time management becomes this huge issue, and just, you know, and, and you're not quite, it's a learned skill a little bit, but you do have to devote, you know, hey, I'd, I'd love to have three hours on that, I can afford 30 minutes. Just kind of set up. Another quick one for, for success, your junior professor, whatever. Just be a good citizen. You'd be surprised how far that goes in departments with senior colleagues, etc. It's like, wow, he always steps up to, dude, she's doing great at teaching. And just, it's not, you don't have to greet, you know, a thousand grants and this and that, but it's like, they want to be here, they're a participant. They try to move the whole venture forward. That goes amazingly far. Can I just quickly? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, just on the practical end, I'm in the same boat a little. <laughs> um, I schedule, like, in a work day when I don't have a meeting, I'll schedule time and, and do the context switch by actually getting into the activity. So even if I don't have a meeting, I will fill my calendar with when I'm supposed to be thinking about that time, when my mind wanders, I try to get back on topic. It's a little practical trick, maybe it might help. Um, I actually, or do you want to say it? Oh, maybe. I say <laughs> so, I would love that it had been true for me what John Stasco said, but I'm afraid that that's a male privilege comment. Um, that being a good citizen as a woman in an academic department is um, over demanding um, that you are called on in ways that they're not called on um, and you can get yourself in so much trouble if you point them out um, it's really risky uh, in fact actually two women very successful women, one actually a feminist and one uh, the president of the ACM, uh, both told me at the end of my PhD, don't get tarred with the feminist brush. You will have a much more difficult time. And I did until just this last year very consciously stay away from that. But I saw a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff all the time. I see it all the time. And unfortunately, um, the citizenship load for a woman is heavier. And that's one of the difficulties, which I'm, yeah. I, I, I don't even know because, I mean, I don't know. I hope that you can actually make a difference because I kind of just, shut up and coped with it. Just not something I recommend. Okay. And I thank you that you spoke out loud now. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really important issue and when I go back to what we discussed before with having children and how different it is for a woman from a man, I mean, I certainly agree with that. But there are, at least, it seems to be better, at least in Northern, in Northern Europe nowadays than before. But still, I think that, it, I, I just want to say, I mean, if you, if you experience a lot of problems because you are, you are, because, uh, you are a woman and not a man, and I think you have to have the, possibili uh, the possibility of validating 
predicting this. And I also, when I talked about going to a psychologist, it does never mean that you go to a psychologist and needs, need uh, a psychologist's help because you're weak. It just means that you get the help you deserve because you want to be brilliant in your job and you need somebody work through the shit <laughs> that you are encountering maybe as a woman in academia. And that is true, I agree totally. Not everywhere, but still it, it happens a lot. And you don't need to be alone with that. And you need to be able not to vent it out in your professional, in your department, because often wise this is not possible. Okay, we are Thank almost you. up to the time. I'm not sure whether there is any final comment. That... Helvig? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I know that there is one more question, but we are really, really... It's a meet up, meet up. Come uh, one... Sounds good. <laughs> I, I deeply apologize. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, it's, it's amazing how much interest there is in this topic, and we are positively, uh, really positively surprised. And uh, those who would like to discuss more about the topic, you are very much welcome to join our meetup, which is after the break. And uh, I would like to thank you for coming, and I would like to thank the panelists for coming and for joining their experience. And I was thinking hard uh, how to thank them apart from warm words from our side. And I thought like they have so much to tell us and maybe they want to write it down and we meet in 10 years and we continue the discussion. <laughs> And uh, yeah, embrace your failures and be kind to yourself. And if you want that we continue on this, you are into it, right? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> We are ready to push this forward. So uh, if there's a need that we have events every year or something like, I mean, personally, <laughs> it's not that I want to cry, but I mean, I, I didn't expect so many people. And I even myself, I feel relieved that it's not just me passing through all of this. So I think just talking about things and having events like this, uh, it will just help us all. So, uh, yes, leave your comments and we can uh, and come to our meeting. Thank you.